Well, welcome everyone today. Today I'm interviewing Jesus and this is the fourth in our series of interviews about humility. Mm. So thanks, babe, for joining me again. It's my pleasure, darling. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're we've... the best interviewer I've got. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're biased. <laughs> it's not that might, they're substandard. That might be the case. But... <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, we should start. No, no. <laughs> All right. Um, so we spent a few interviews talking about humility and what humility mm. truly is. Mm. And I suppose the first question I had for you today is why is it, or if you can just give us an overview of why we as these beautiful souls created by God seem to find humility, this beautiful state, so difficult? Well, I think it relates to the primary underlying emotional injury that the whole human race has, and that is this injury of wanting to be self-reliant. As soon as we embrace self-reliance, we go into this state where we desire to do what we wish to do. Um, and if what we wish to do can't be achieved, we then usually start to act in a very, um, what you classify as an angry or, or fear-based manner. And unfortunately, that's the under, underlying main trigger to the reason why we don't have a great deal of humility. The if you look at the this injury, this injury has been around since Ammon and Amman were first on the earth. So it's been with the whole of humanity for th tens of thousands of years. And as a result of that, it's firmly embedded inside of hu humankind's nature as an emotional injury. So it's the very first emotional injury that's ever been um, placed inside of, a, of another person. And um, when Ammon and a man had children, they, they had children under the, with this emotional injury. And it's gotten passed down through the generations and built more strongly over that period of time. So while that injury is in play, um, there, is all, there is a very strong desire to deny any emotion, particularly any emotion that will result from us feeling uh, that we don't have control of our own lives. Yeah. So is it like the, a feeling of entitlement to be self-reliant mm. that then mm. causes us to resist? Yeah, well, it, when we focus on self-reliance so much, we, we have become so resistive to humility. And, and the, the fact is that the majority of people on the planet are very resistive to any form of humility now as a result. And... Um, I feel that's the primary reason why. The secondary reason why is because we have these underlying emotions that we can't deal with. It. There's a feeling in us that we cannot deal with overwhelming emotion. So any time we become overwhelmed by emotion that's negative in particular, we have a tendency to shut down. And this desire has also been with the human race for quite some time because it's related to the issue of self-reliance. Whenever we become self-reliant and then we do not get what we want, mm -hmm. then there are often overwhelming emotions, particularly if, if we don't get any pleasure and we, and we receive pain. There's overwhelming emotions generally. But unfortunately, we don't want to feel them. We choose to not feel them because we don't believe that we can cope with overwhelming emotions by ourselves. The reality is that all of humanity can cope with overwhelming emotions, even without God. Mm. But um, the majority of humanity choose not to. And because we choose to not deal with anything that's overwhelming, we then shut that down. And that's a, a also a great uh, creator of the lack of humility on the planet. So, so it's the combination of what happened with regard to self-reliance and then what happened with regard to our belief systems with regard to whether we can cope with emotion. And if you look at it today even, every time we speak to emotion, you know, to a group about emotion, as you know, the majority of times, particularly if it's a new group, there's a deep underlying resistance to even addressing the issue. And then if you look at the majority of the criticisms we receive uh, through, you know, the media or, 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 or through public opinion, 
the majority of criticism is about, oh, they're triggering another emotion in a person and this is very damaging and dangerous, mm. as if feeling emotion is actually a dangerous thing. Mm. And, and this and is... And implies a vulnerability in a per- like a vulnerability to harm or manipulation. Exactly, or which, is yeah. a, a, which I find uh, ironic in a way because I actually believe that if you don't release your mm. underlying emotional injuries, that is when you are highly able to be manipulated. And in fact, you open yourself completely to manipulation when you try to deny an emotion such as fear, for example. Um, and, and also when you deny emotion such as grief, you, you become highly manipulated, you, you're very much involved in addictions, and as long as somebody can meet your addictions, then you're very satisfied. And so it's so easy to manipulate a person in that state. And so the reality is that what mankind fears is actually the thing that they need to become less manipulated and controlled by their environment and particularly by others. And so uh, I find it very ironic in some ways that the very thing that they are afraid of is the very thing that will free them from any kind of addictive manipulation. Yeah. Mm. I wonder, (laughs) could you just give a brief example of how it is when we avoid our emotion that we're most open to manipulation? Well, for example, if let's say we avoid our emotion of being lonely... Um, This is a a big emotion that many people have, a feeling, a fear of being alone, a fear of being lonely. And when we avoid that emotion, we then need people to be with us. And we need them to be with us so much that if they were going to reject our opinion, we would then not state our opinion in order to maintain the relationship with the person. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do then is deny our own opinion for the sake of uh, someone staying with, with us and, and therefore helping us to remain feeling like we're not lonely anymore. Mm-hmm. So this is an indica- if we could just go through the loneliness feeling and come out the other end of it not feeling lonely even when we are alone, then, then anybody who's with us would always get our true opinions yeah. and, and we would be our complete self. Mm-hmm. But the reality is most people on the planet are not their complete self because they are so afraid of, of somebody or even a whole group of people eventually rejecting them and, or attacking them and, and then they'll end up feeling alone and they can't cope with that feeling they feel mm-hmm. and so what they finish up doing is shutting down themselves in order to maintain you know, contact with the people that they feel they would like to have contact with. So, so now any person in their environment can manipulate them with this lonely threat. Yeah. So, so, so if I have an opinion that you don't agree with and I also have a feeling of loneliness that, I, that I'm so frightened of feeling, then you can manipulate me quite easily by just threatening to leave me. Yeah. And, and so I then will not uh, let myself have my own opinion when I'm with you if I am so afraid of you leaving me. And, and, this, uh, and this then opens me completely to manipulation by the other person. Yeah. And, and this is where the irony of self-reliance is I become more self-reliant and in the process, in the end, I become more dependent upon other people yes. uh, for, the, for the substitute of, my, of these emotions. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so I feel it's the addictions that are in play and and many of the things we'll talk about today are about addictions really it's the addictions that are in play that cause so much trouble in terms of our own future development uh, with with regard to being ourselves and and if we're so afraid of expressing ourselves emotionally which is what humility is really all about being real emotionally mm-hmm. uh, along with other things of course but uh, one of the things it's about is being real emotionally being the real emotional self the, everything that we feel on display mm-hmm. and if we're so afraid of another person or what they believe about that or feel about that then of course we're going to shut that down automatically And so this creates an internal resistance. So we can't really say that the other people around us are creating the resistance. We are creating the resistance by by not allowing ourselves to feel overwhelmed by the emotion that would be caused if I was just myself. Yeah, Mm. yeah. 
Okay, and that is the purpose of our discussion today, is just to talk about the resistance to humility. Yeah. Uh, We talked a lot about what it really is, but now I'd like to really delve into how we resist humility. What Mm. are some of the ways we resist humility? Yes. Because obviously, we're all, most of us, walking around in a state that isn't humble. Yes. I suppose the one that comes first to mind is the is what you could say is the opposite to humility, mm-hmm. which is the feeling of arrogance. Mm-hmm. So I feel that probably that one we could start with. Great. <coughs> so, so what is arrogance? How do we? Well, that arrogance is a feeling that exists inside of a person that they are better than another person, that they are superior to the other person, that they know more than the other person that their value, their personal value or worth is greater than the other person's. And of course this comes out in lots of different ways. You know, if, a, if somebody uh, feels that the skin colour is related to how good or bad they are, then of course it turns into what we call racism. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's just an arrogance towards a person of a particular race because I believe I'm white and therefore I believe I'm better than a person who's black. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also comes in all forms of uh, in all forms of life. So, so if we look at religion, sometimes a person who gains a specific religion then has an arrogance towards another person of another type of religion, and and I see this even developing amongst the so-called divine love community, where they have an arrogance that yes. that they become because they now know the truth about or the God's truth about things that that then automatically makes them better than somebody else. And it does not actually make mm-hmm. them better. And in fact, in a lot of ways, it can make them worse, particularly if they do not uh, follow the principles of the teachings of love. They can actually then display a lack of love towards others through their arrogance mm-hmm. and actually degrade their condition even though they know the truth. Yeah. So the emotion of arrogance uh, can come out in all sorts of areas, religiously, politically, socially, environmentally, uh, racially, mm-hmm. and, and we see arrogance in our society in almost every area or walk of life. You know, the religious people are arrogant towards the scientists and the scientists feel arrogant towards the religious people. And, yes. you know, some religions feel more arrogant than uh, towards one type of religion than another. And, and you get also the same kind of arrogance occurring in the family, where parents generally have a large degree of arrogance towards their children. They have a feeling of ownership over their children, that they are superior to their children. And this arrogance uh, causes them to act in all sorts of unloving ways towards their own children even. And so arrogance is a big block towards humility. Mm. (coughs) And I know you've just said that arrogance is really like the opposite of humility, but a lot of people feel that it's right to have an opinion and uh, to believe in that opinion. Uh, how does that relate to arrogance? Like, if we well, are well, I do feel it is right to have an opinion. You, you know, there's nothing wrong with having an opinion that you believe you have gathered over a period of your life, and and that you you've you've come to a certain acknowledgement of. It's when these opinions make you believe that you are better mm-hmm. than another person that it turns into arrogance. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing to have an opinion. But it's quite another then to believe that that opinion makes you a better person than another. And it's the feeling. Remember I said that with arrogance, and in fact everything we'll discuss today, they are all feelings. They're not just words. They're actually feelings that we have inside of us that are projected towards the other. So, so if I have an arrogant feeling towards yourself, even though I might know more, let's say I know more about electronics than you do, you, which is true, true. Yeah. and you know more about the occupational health uh, industry than I do like that's the reality so 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 if I believe because I know more about electronics than you do that that makes me uh, better than you are now I'm having a feeling inside of me of superiority over you mm-hmm. and that feeling is the is the feeling of arrogance that we're speaking of and that feeling is the damaging feeling because it is actually an attack on the other person it's a projection of condescension and other emotions towards the other person. You're actually telling the other person through your soul-based feeling Im- interaction with them that they are lesser than you are. Mm. And this is very damaging to your soul personally when you do that, but also it's very damaging to the soul who receives that arrogance, particularly if they're very young, because they will come to believe they are less 
than you are. Mm -hmm. And this is very damaging to them. And, and we know that the issue of self-worth on the planet is so bad mm -hmm. and, and causes so many trouble, much trouble. But the reason why it does is because there's so much arrogance projected at people when they're very, very young. So they grow up feeling like they don't have any worth. And then they wonder why they act like they don't have any worth. Yeah. And of course they're going to act like they don't have any worth because that's the feeling they have inside of them. So, so the, the feeling, we must remember with all these things we described, it's a feeling of arrogance that we have towards the other person, a feeling of superiority, a feeling of condescension, a feeling that I am better than the other person just because of what I know mm -hmm. or, or just because of what I have learned or just because I am older or just because I am a different colour or just, and, and we could list all the, the long list of reasons that cause uh, this underlying emotion. It's a very damaging to our soul and in fact uh, it causes a lot of people to arrive in the spirit world in a lot of darkness, this emotion of arrogance. Mm -hmm. And in addition, the problem with the emotion of arrogance is it causes people to stay in their condition because mm -hmm. they already believe themselves to be right without knowing that they're actually wrong or even being open to the idea that they might be wrong. And that's what I was about to ask you about. How does it affect our openness to new ideas? I'm supposing it closes us completely. Completely. It's like every time a new idea is presented to us, if it's not something, if it's something that would make us feel small or something that would make us feel like we have to give up something that we have as a strongly held opinion, then we won't, we'll refuse to do it. We will just straight out refuse, even though... And, and I've seen people be very illogical in their arrogance. Mm -hmm. It is one of the most illogical emotions you can imagine, where people hold on to an opinion. And, and like many people would know this from the opinions of racism, for example. Yes. Like, like the reality is we are all people. That is very obvious. Mm -hmm. The reality is we can procreate with each other, you know, people of different races. So that would make us all the same. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the arrogant position that one race is better than another it, it is so illogical mm -hmm. that uh, as, to, as to render it, just the logic of it, it renders it stupid as an idea or concept of racism. Yes. And yet, how many people are racist? Yes. Like there are literally millions of people on this planet that are still racist yes. holding on to this concept that is obviously false, but they obviously have some kind of emotional you know, baggage that causes them to hold on to the concept and, and a desire to feel superior or, or, or greater than another. And this is where I feel a lot of uh, different movies have indicated these kind of things. Like, you remember the mu movie uh, American Beauty mm -hmm. where, where there was this, the next door neighbour who was, who was arrogant towards Emmy homosexual yeah. and then, then ended up feeling homosexual feelings like yeah. himself. And... And, and, and yet so afraid of them and overwhelmed by them that he eventually desires to murder his neighbour yes. you know, because of the fear of the emotion. And, and this is the kind of thing that happens on the planet with arrogance. I've seen, I and you, have both, both of us have seen first century all through of our life mm. in the last 2,000 years. We've both seen almost everything that, that has been damaging on the planet have as a part of it this underlying emotion of arrogance. Yeah, yeah. certainly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, the next set of questions is about God and arrogance. So mm -hmm. how does our viewpoint of ourselves when we're arrogant conflict with God's viewpoint or God's truth? Well, what we're doing, if we think about it, with arrogance is we're setting ourselves up above God. We're basically saying, and this is the issue of self-reliance too, we're basically setting ourselves up above God. We're basically wanting the universe to conform to everything I want it to do uh, and in my self-reliance I am completely happy to have anything in the universe do exactly what I want um, but we don't understand the principle that actually God's laws are greater than we ourselves are and in fact God's laws govern us mm -hmm. and we become lawless in fact when we're arrogant we believe that we are beyond a law Mm. And if you look at almost all forms of arrogance, whether it's racism uh, um, or, or some other kind of, of, of arrogance, um, you always see that the person who is a racist believes they are above the law, even above the law of other humankind, mm. um, let alone God's laws. 
Yeah, I can see that in myself with issues of authority. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the past, I've felt, um, and I see it now as an arrogance, but I've felt that because of baggage I have with authority, that I can defy authority or that rules don't apply Plus to me, you. like mm-hmm. rules of the world, mm. the common law on the planet, you know, that it's okay to bend that rule because... Yeah. And that's this form of arrogance. Really, it is, it? yeah. yeah. And, and this whole concept that we should be able to bend all of the laws yeah. to suit ourselves comes from this underlying arrogance really Mm. so so even you know when we decide that we can speed when the speed limit is a certain that is also an arrogant position you know we're making the decision above what the law has made or common the group a group of people commonly have made now if we're going to take that position we're going to need to make sure that we're really in harmony with God's laws if we don't damage, if we're not going to damage our soul. Yeah. Unfortunately, most of the time we're not in harmony with God's laws, and as a result of that, we, our our condition rapidly gets worse. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, how difficult is arrogance to release from ourselves, from our soul, if it's a very common injury? Yeah, I feel it's a very hard emotion to release from the soul. It it comes from a lot of a lot of very deep fear relating to our own sense of worth mm. and and how we are challenged by other people around us and other situations around us with regard to our sense of worth. And any emotion that has as its core an underlying feeling of a lack of worth is going to be quite difficult to release. Of course, we only become arrogant when we are resistive to that underlying emotion. Mm. So the reality is arrogance, uh, while we maintain it, we almost have this underlying feeling of justification of our position. And that is the hard thing to get rid of, justifying our own unloving position. And in particular, when we believe we're right, that is a very, very difficult thing to then get, get rid of when we actually believe that our own unloving position is correct. And, and f- f- if I can give an example, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Most people on the planet would say that if somebody killed your son or daughter, then you should have the right to kill their son or daughter. Mm. Now, this is a position of what they believe to be justice. Right? Uh, it's a, it comes from the underlying principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Mm. Now, most people would argue that that is fine to actually have, you know, this viewpoint. They shouldn't have killed my son in the first place, and so I now should be able to take the action of killing theirs. Their son or them. Or, is, yeah, yeah, or them. Yeah. And the reality, the reality is that this is not a very logical belief. Mm. Yeah. Because if I kill your son and then you kill my son... In the end, we've both lost a son and we're still both tremendously unhappy about losing our sons. Mm -hmm. Um, And killing yours hasn't made the loss of my son go away. Mm -hmm. So so it's a very logical belief, but I'm taking it because I have this arrogant position that justice is, is demanded. Now, when I start to see that justice is not actually a loving position... I become very challenged. Mm. I want to argue that justice is a loving position. And once I release the emotion of arrogance where I, that I believe justice is the loving position, I come to see how illogical this sense of justice is and therefore how unloving it must be. Mm. But until that point in time, I don't see it. And, and so I sort of see like... The hard parts of arrogance are that you're holding on to a concept within yourself that you believe to be right and you have some very, very large emotional investments in it being right. So any person who's a racist, for example, has a very large emotional reason inside of themselves of denying an emotion inside of themselves, why they want to hold on to that position. Mm -hmm. And so releasing the emotion requires a lot of sincerity a lot of desire for love, a lot of desire for truth, and a lot of desire to actually get to the underlying core emotion. Yeah. Is that why arrogance would develop in a person? 
because of a resistance to an underlying emotion? Always. You know, every, thing, every one of these resistances that we talk about with humility all relate to our desire to get away from an actual emotion that we are carrying around inside of our soul. And, that's, and we're afraid of being overwhelmed by that emotion and that's the only reason why we then develop qualities like arrogance or pride or any of these other, many of these other qualities we'll discuss. Mm. Mm. Okay. And you mentioned that it's something that darkens our souls quite a bit. Is that... Yes, because uh, the problem with arrogance is that it's aimed towards another person. So there are some uh, resistances to a humility that we have inside of us that are more aimed towards ourselves. So, you know, for example, a lack of self-worth is a resistance to humility, but it's aimed towards ourselves. We feel bad, we deprecate ourselves, we treat ourselves badly, but we're not actually harming another person on top of that, mm -hmm. generally. Um, you know, or oftentimes we're not harming them as much. And, and so, of course, the degradation to our own soul is only related to our own treatment of ourselves rather than both to our treatment of ourselves and to another. Mm. We are not creating a huge amount of harm to others generally as much as we would be if we were, say, in an arrogant position. So, so, so this means then that there are certain groups of emotions that are resistances to humility that actually double our damage up because we're damaging ourselves and another person or the environment around us. But there are other emotions that we are holding on to that are just to do with ourselves and therefore we're only damaging ourselves and therefore it has less of an uh, impact, a negative impact upon our soul. Mm. Arrogance is one of those emotions that causes a huge amount of darkness in the soul. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, well, perhaps something a little bit more about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, this issue of the ego or the false ego is that a resistance to humility yeah well let, let's define ego versus or true ego versus false ego shall we Great. um i feel the people who use the term on earth ego to mean basically um you know something that is a facade that uh, we carry around with us a false facade but the reality is, you know, if you look at the origin of the word, it just means soul, the real self. So if we look at true ego, that, that is to have a concept of your true self. And there's no damage in doing that. Uh -huh. That's exactly what God wants you to do. But if we look at this uh, false ego, which is the ego terminology that most people on the planet use today, um, we're now referring to the desire to create and maintain a facade to not be real with other people around us. And so I would say that the ego is the facade self, if you like, mm -hmm. yeah, under that definition. The false ego is equal to what we've discussed to people before, the facade self. Yeah. The facade self being the person that we create that has been created so that we can deny the real self and deny the uh, hurt or injured self that our parents have created. And, and to me, that is the ego, if you like, the false ego of a person. And that, maintaining that can cause a huge amount of problems with humility. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So why does it create problems with humility? Well, uh, it, there's many reasons probably why that it creates problems with humility. Um, if you... If you examine being humble as being your real self emotionally at all times, in other words, being truthful to your real self emotionally at all times, then of course, if we're maintaining a facade at all times <laughs> or most of the time, then most of the time we're not being humble at all. Mm. Uh, and therefore, it's impossible for us to get to any causal emotion. It's all, we're blocking God, we're blocking the truth, we're blocking love from entering our soul because God's love can only enter our soul when we are in a state of truth and we're only going to be in a state of truth when we walk away from our facade and we start getting into the real person that we are. What do we mm -hmm. really feel? So, so it's a huge impediment to our relationship with God, our relationship with ourselves even, it's a huge impediment with, but it's also a huge impediment with our relationship with everyone else because everyone else starts interacting with the facade. Mm. And the problem with them interacting with the facade is that they never get to see our real self and really they're reacting with a person who doesn't exist. And at some point in the future they'll come to realise that person that they were reacting with wasn't even the person 
that they, you know, that they believed them to be. And, and so sooner or later, everybody, including ourselves, is going to be very disappointed with the outcome when we're living in this ego, false ego-based facade. Mm. Mm. Then why is this state so attractive to so many of us? Ah, oh, well, there's some very basic and important reasons why it's attractive. The first thing is that when we're in a facade, we do not have to confront society. In other words, we don't have to, we don't have to act differently to what other people want us to be, right? And this is, a, of course, a way to prevent all forms of attack. Mm. It's a way to prevent all forms of grief. It's a way to prevent projections coming at us personally that we are not good enough or not what everyone wants us to be. Um, and so it has huge motivations when you think about it. We're, so we're basically trying to become what society views, or let's put it more succinctly, become what the people who we associate mostly with in society view yes. as the acceptable person. So, so if, if we associate with a whole group of new ages, you know, then the society-based facade will be my becoming the ideal new age person. If, if I'm associating with a group of uh, born-again Christians, then my ideal facade is going to be that, I, that I'm going to become the ideal born-again Christian. And while I am that, I will be accepted by that particular group of people. Mm -hmm. If uh, if if I'm living, you know, in a ghetto somewhere in you know one of the countries that uh, has many of these, and almost every country has them, and uh, then my facade will be tough. If I'm a male, I'm a tough guy, who, you know, who's not afraid to get into a fight here and there, and that's my facade. Mm -hmm. And and my facade is going to be very very dependent upon my immediate environment as to what, what is acceptable. So the irony is, is that the society as a whole may reject my facade, but as long as I'm getting my addictions met through my immediate society, my immediate associations, then I'll maintain the facade for as long as I want to maintain mm -hmm. it. And because it doesn't confront any of those people. And, and you look at what happens when we try to get out of our facade in that environment. You get attacked immensely by the people in, in your immediate environment. Even though other people in the world may agree with your changes, yeah. in that immediate environment you're going to get attacked mm -hmm. uh, as a result because they, they want you to maintain this facade because that's the facade they're also maintaining. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look at that, there's the society-based confrontation. Then there's the family-based confrontation. Now, most of our facade comes from family in some way. So, so if I begin confronting and breaking down my facade, I'm really confronting and breaking down all of the family-based belief systems. Mm. Now, of course, if my family uh, is you know, not able to be confronted with any emotion, they are going to react very negatively to, to that. They're going to become very strongly opposed to my breaking down not only my own facade, but, but really what I'm doing by breaking down my facade is I'm also breaking down theirs, yes. right? And many of them feel that that's happening without their choice. Uh, you know, obviously it's, they can choose to ignore it, or, or, but, but they don't feel that way because they feel it as a personal attack upon their way of life. And now you're going to have huge amounts of emotions being projected at you from your family, rejection emotions. You'll end up feeling probably alone in your family once you continue doing this. And so if you look at the dynamic, what's really going on with regard to the false ego is that we are maintaining this false ego-based facade so that society is not confronted, so that the family is not confronted and so that I am not confronted by the confrontation from society and family if I choose to be my real self. So there's a huge amount of emotional investment in maintaining a facade. Mm. <coughs> mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in the last interview, we discussed humility involving being the real self mm -hmm. and, and you're saying the facade is what's covering our real self. Are my blocks to just being real, just the addictions of other people's good opinion of me, this investment in avoiding the confrontation that you just mentioned? Is well, there more? Well, really that's the top layer of the problem because mm -hmm. the underneath layer of the problem is that 
is that I am invested in what you think of me because if you don't think well of me, I will have certain emotions to feel. Mm. And they are the emotions I want to avoid. So I have a lot of selfish reasons then for trying to get your good opinion. Mm. And my selfish reasons for attempting to get your good opinion, and by maintaining a facade I might get that good opinion, is that, is that I get to avoid what it would feel like if you attacked me. Mm. So, so I have a personal emotional investment then in not being attacked. Right? That's my personal emotional investment. And so, and so it's not just about gaining the good opinion of others. That's the top layer. The, the underneath layer is how much I want to avoid the bad opinion because of how it makes me feel and because I'm afraid to feel those feelings. If I was not afraid to feel those feelings, then I would have no investment. But the reality is because I'm afraid to feel those feelings, I'm now so focused on, on getting those feelings met and, and avoiding the feelings uh, that are actually inside of me. And I'm still carrying them around. They're still in me. So I carry them around wherever I go. Ironically, like, ironically my law of attraction, or God's law of attraction, based upon my soul condition, is going to attract certain events where people do treat me badly mm -hmm. and then I'll obviously react in some way. A lot of times I'll react with arrogance or anger yeah. uh, at the previous emotion because, because, uh, because I'm trying to avoid those, the confrontation of those particular emotions. Ironically, though, my soul is going around creating all these fires Right, it's creating all the fires of, because of the emotions in me, and then I go running around putting them out by conciliatory, being you know, being you know, being what everybody around me wants, even if it means completely shutting myself down or completely acting in a manner that's completely out of harmony with my own ideals, and, and I do all of that because I want to avoid the feelings that are being triggered inside of me, not because I want to avoid the feelings that are inside of you. Yes. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm avoiding the feelings that are inside of me that have been created by you attacking those particular feelings or positions through my action. Mm -hmm. And so it's, a, it's sort of like we need to start seeing these problems not as somebody else's problem. They are my problems. My willingness to have a lack of integrity is all about my problem. It's yeah. not about somebody else's problem. Yeah. yeah. So you could have 100 people attacking you if you have integrity you will allow a hundred people to attack you and just feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at historically, all of the people who are respected in, on the planet generally, sooner or later they've become, they are people who have been attacked and yet remained firm about their position of love without being arrogant. Mm. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Mm. And when you, just rewinding a little, you said we're going around making fires and then trying to put them out. Mm -hmm. This dynamic of making the fire and then putting it out, is it us, is it our real self that's making the fire or is it, what is the dynamic that's happening there? Yeah, well, it's a combination of our hurt self and our facade mm -hmm. that is creating these fires. And, and in fact, our soul is going to continue creating these fires because that's the way God created the law of attraction. The law of attraction is such that our soul, when it's out of harmony with love, will create negative events or circumstances or situations, which will then bring to us those events or situations so that we can see what our true condition is like. So our soul is going to put around, put out, continue putting out, putting out is not the right word, creating the fires as we as we progress so we're, we're there creating all these fires and then we take actions to put them out ironically we don't deal with the emotion that created them so it's, it's almost like somebody going around with a match lighting all these fires which is at us really in our soul and then somebody deciding that the best way to stop that from happening is to go around after them with a water can right rather than take the box of matches off of them right <laughs> and and the reality is that we do this with ourselves constantly, where we're going, we're going around lighting the fires, not stopping and thinking, well, hang on a sec, the matches are in my hand and the light is in my hand, now maybe I need to put down the matches and work on the underlying reason why I've picked up the matches and started lighting these fires. And, and really that's what we're doing with, uh, with, by, by maintaining the ego, the false facade. Well, what we're trying to do is, a, is a, we're trying to make ourselves look good 
Mm-hmm. To, to the environment. And remember, every environment's got a different requirement, so it's going to be pretty hard to make ourselves look good to everyone. Right? Yeah. And, and in addition, our soul is going to be creating the fires because, uh, because the fire, if I want to make myself look good, it's because I have some injuries inside of myself about myself, and those underlying injuries will be creating the fire. And then I run around putting them all out, right, um, as, just in terms of, uh, you know, taking actions to put them out, not understanding that the whole thing is very uneconomical. The best thing, the best approach I can do is take the box of matches off myself and stop lighting the fires and look at the underlying soul, uh, you know, causal reasons inside of myself that have caused my soul to create these fires. Um, now, that's what we would do if we weren't so interested in the ego. We would automatically do that. But when we're interested in this false ego, we don't do that. What we decide to do is to run around putting out the fires because we want to continue maintaining this false ego for a number of reasons. Because we want to look good to other people, but also because we want to look good to ourselves, Mm. make out that we're something different than we are. And in addition, we get to avoid the painful emotions that are inside of us as well. Mm. So, so So we have so many investments in keeping it. Yeah. yeah, it just strikes me as you're speaking that it's like God is operating on the soul and those two things are lighting fires and then this this facade part of us is just trying to work against the whole process, which exactly. I suppose is the definition of humili- of a lack of humility, isn't well, it's it? It's also the definition of stupidity, <laughs> really, you think about it. It's like, like how, how what, what's the point of doing that? Like, And the irony is that because we don't understand the soul, most people don't understand the soul, the irony is that they don't understand what's creating all these fires, yes. Um, but if they had a look at what was inside of their soul, they could easily see the correlation between what their soul actually feels and why the person is responding in the manner that they actually are. So it sounds like every time there's a fire in my life, I need to uh, stop trying to damp down the flames and mm-hmm. really see what is being presented to me here. Yes. Yeah. yeah very important. Yeah. Very important. And, and in fact, if I had any sense of myself, I would want to do that. I wouldn't want to try and make out that it didn't happen. So, so, you know, like uh, we've often talked in groups, as you know, where somebody says to us, oh, yeah, no, I know all of that. And I say to them, well, you say you know all of that, but what happened to you last week? Because often I know what happened to them last week. You know, they had this terrible traumatic thing happen. Oh, but that was because everybody else, you know, that's that's because what everybody else did. And not understanding that their own soul has created fire. So, so when they come and tell me then that, uh, that they already know everything that I'm talking about, I'm saying, I'm sorry, you think you know, which is actually an arrogant position. Yeah. And, and on top of that, you are maintaining a facade because the reality is your soul is creating these fires that you're not even acknowledging. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah. light the fire, oh, there's no fire. Light another <laughs> fire, oh, there's no fire. <laughs> no fire, no fire. You know, like... And, and this is how, you know, in our own arrogance and sense of uh, ego, we, we have this way of ignoring everything yeah. as a result. And, and then we tell somebody who comes along and speaks to us about it, we go, oh, I know everything you're talking about. And, and I say to a person, well, if you knew everything I was talking about, not only would you be at one with God right now, but your soul wouldn't be creating fires every single day of the week either. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that really leads to my next question, which was if I personally or someone else we we discover okay i'm in this facade how do i begin to get closer to my real self how do i begin to work through this issue well again this is a very difficult thing for most people because it requires some level of honesty at the beginning to actually be self-reflective we we need to we need to actually start asking ourselves questions about ourselves really and and ask ourselves, what is the truth of my life? Am I truly happy? Is my body feeling good? Like, you know, am I getting younger? Am I getting wiser? (laughs) Am I, you know, am I acting in harmony with love in in all of my interactions with people? Is my life happier? You know, these are all questions we need to ask ourselves. And if if they are not, if if it's not happening, then it's because there is something that we are blocking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's something that is going on inside of ourselves. We need to stop presenting ourselves to the world in the manner that we want the world to see and we need to start presenting ourselves to everyone as we truly are. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that requires a lot of qualities that the majority of us don't have initially, which are courage, integrity, mm -hmm. honesty. You know, these are qualities that are often spoken of, but very few people actually have when it comes to living in their facade. So, so my suggestion is to pray about qualities, gaining qualities of integrity, courage, honesty, truthfulness, and pray to God about you know, developing a desire within ourselves to develop these qualities, even if nobody on the planet develops them other than ourselves, sure. and, and engage that process of developing these qualities so that we can at least have an honest examination of ourselves. So that's what I feel needs to happen with regard to that. Obviously, as we go through that, we'll start exposing some underlying fears that we have and addictions that we have that cause us to maintain a facade. Mm -hmm. But we won't be able to do that if, if we're completely ignorant of our own condition and what we're actually attracting in our own life. Mm. Mm. So it sounds like we have to look honestly, not only at our... or begin to want to look honestly at ourselves, but from what you said, look at the evidence already around us in terms of what is in our life right now yes. and what does that tell me about me rather than about other people. Yes. If we, if we took it as a global problem, which it is, yeah. um, then, then we'd go like this. We, we, would, we, we would reason like this. The world has a lot of very, very dark problems at the moment. We, we go to war. Mm -hmm. There are murders, there are rapes, there are, you know, there are very dark things happening on the earth all the time. There's people starving to death. There's millions of people starving to death every single year. And these are all global problems. Now, if I am self-reflective, I will begin to see how I myself and emotions inside of me create these global problems. Mm -hmm. The fact that these global problems exist means that we haven't got everything sorted out. Yeah. Now, if everybody other than me is the, is the problem, then that would mean that there's seven billion people on the planet all thinking that it's somebody else that caused the problem. <laughs> so, so the reality is that it's got to be the seven billion people on the planet who are causing the problem. <laughs> Does that, that make sense? Now, if we examine that at a global perspective, then that, yes, the 7 billion people on the planet are causing these problems. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we haven't got everything sorted out and therefore our facade is pretty useless. It's not actually working. And while we're in denial of these problems, we're not going to fix anything. Now, let's shrink that down to our personal life. The same applies to an even greater degree to our personal life. Mm -hmm. If our personal life has a huge group of issues and problems that are involved with it and our own body has a problems with it, then there is even a higher correlation between our own unhealed emotions and our own belief systems that are, and our own desires and our own actions creating our life. And, and we are the person who is the centre of our own life yeah. that would then make sense from a from a logical perspective that if our life is a bit of a mess then we are the person at the center of it who's creating it and we need to see that and uh, and particularly in an environment like in most places in the west where where you know in other countries we have western countries imposing things upon the other countries and and often a person's life gets a bit out of their own control because of the imposition but in western countries most of us don't have a huge group of impositions in comparison. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is if we're in the West and we believe that we're all healed emotionally and we're all, and we, and we're all got everything sorted out, then it is a gross, gross lie that we're telling ourselves. Uh, and in addition, harming, we're not exam going to examine our own life. And remember the discussion we had when we were in USA this time on the Sunday, I think it was, about um, denial and addictions where... We went out to dinner with the group of people and they were in so much denial about their own emotions and how their own emotions create a lot of the decisions that the government was taking. Mm -hmm. and, and once we start talking about how challenged everybody gets about that, like, yeah. whoa, it's like heavy emotions after that. Yes. And, and this is the kind of self-examination that we're going to need if we're in a facade. Yeah, mm. yeah. that's mm. great. Thank you. Mm. All right, so, so far we've talked about arrogance and... Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I should write these down one other time. So there was arrogance. And a facade. Yeah. Or which we called the false ego. Yeah. Yep. 
What would be next on your list? Um, well, I, I, there's so I have, many, isn't yes, there? Yes, I like, have one on the list that yeah, we can sure. bring up. Um, uh, judgment and criticism, okay. which I think is an interesting one that perhaps we don't always associate with the lack of humility. Is there an E in there? Probably not. Yes. Yeah, oh, no, no, there's not. I see, I can't spell either. Both you and I have... <laughs> Maybe it depends what continent you live on as well. Yeah. yeah. Judgment and criticism. Yeah. yeah, these are very similar to arrogance, actually, in a lot of ways. Um, how, how would you define judgment for us? Well, again, judgment is an emotion that's coming out of me. So we know it's not anything to do with what I'm saying. I can be telling the truth in a loving way mm -hmm. or I can tell the truth in a judgmental way. Mm -hmm. So in a, if it's in a judgmental way, I have an emotion coming out of me towards the other person that I am superior to them, mm -hmm. that I know better than they do and so forth when I'm in a judgmental way. And in fact, it's, a judgment is a lot about worth, my opinion of the other person's worth. Mm -hmm. So when I am in a state where I am judging, I have a strong opinion inside of myself that the, I am more worthy than the other person. Yeah. On, and it might be on just a particular issue, um, but it could be on a whole group of issues. And sometimes it's on a group you know, where I believe that it's everything to do with my being is more worthy than, you, than somebody else's. Now, this, it's an emotion where that is a projection at the other person, which is quite a damaging projection. It's belittling, condescending. It, it, it's, uh, it causes us to have an obnoxious viewpoint towards other people it's uh it, it it creates a sense in them that they are lesser or it, it attempts to create a sense in another person that they are lesser than I, I, I am and it it allows me to maintain a sense of personal superiority mm -hmm. so in other words I, I i by judging you i can make maintain a sense that i'm better than you and, uh, and judgment, of course, has huge problems when it comes to humility, of course. So, so that's certainly the case. Mm. Um, criticism is closely aligned in that uh, many times we... And, and, and again, we've got to be careful. Criticism is an emotion. Mm. It's not a statement. Mm -hmm. so you see, if, if I can make a statement of truth, right? Um, the statement of truth can be... You know, completely. Like, for example, do you like, do you like these flowers? And uh, and my feeling is, yeah, I love those flowers. A lot of them look like Australian natives, and uh, you know, they many of them appeal to me colour-wise and everything. Uh, are they dying? Yes, yes, they are dying. They've been cut and they're dying, right? Um, and I don't understand why people want to cut, to be frank, cut flowers um, because they immediately begin dying. Honestly. Um, so, you know, I'd much rather see them alive for a long period of time. Now, my statement that they're dying is not a judgment or a criticism. Mm -hmm. It is just a statement of truth. It mm -hmm. is dying. And, uh, but, but somebody could take that to be a statement of judgment or criticism. Mm -hmm. so, so in other words, if they gave me the flowers and they were a nice, bright bunch and I said, you've given me a heap of dying things now, right, which is a statement of truth, they might take that as a rejection of their gift, yes. right? Which which they've now taken as a criticism, even though I don't mean it to be such. It's just a statement of truth. So it depends upon the giver, and this is where it's very very difficult for most people to determine judgment and criticism mm -hmm. because most people feel criticised or judged even when you're just stating the truth. Yes. So this is not what I'm speaking of. I'm not speaking of when we're just stating the truth without any emotional intention behind it. What I'm speaking of with judgment and criticism is, is a desire to make the other person feel something as a result of the statement, yes. right? which is a very different condition. If I, mm -hmm. So if I just saying, oh, they're, they're dying, you know, and it's just a statement of truth, well, that's a statement of truth. But if I'm saying, I'm pointing out to you that they're dying because I want to criticise that you cut them, mm -hmm. right? And I want to actually make you feel bad about cutting them, or, or, yeah, yeah. right? Rather than just examine the truth about why why you cut them, then um, I'm straight away now involved in this feeling of judgment 
mm -hmm. from myself. And it's a feeling that comes out of me. Yeah. Not, and, and unfortunately, most people are not very sensitive to feelings, and so they don't know when the feeling is coming out of a person when they're just stating the truth. Yes. Right? Um, so, you know, this is a, a sort of a muddies the waters a bit when it comes to this emotion. It into, does, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's, uh, sometimes it feels like you can have a, a, what appears to be a subtle um, exchange with someone that can be laden with judgment, can't it? It can be um, overt or it can be very underhanded. But in both cases, I'm assuming you're talking about the emotion that's coming in. Yes, we see the underhanded judgments uh, very much occurring in families, but also in society, these underhanded judgments. So, so for example, um, we've had many things written about us right now, and, and, and one of the judgments is that, is that we're a cult. Mm -hmm. right? Now, it's not a statement of truth, for example. You and I don't lead anything. We live in our own property. We, we don't have anybody living with us. We don't monitor anybody's life to see whether they're practicing the principles of divine truth that we teach. We don't attack them if they aren't. We don't, you know, we don't give them all of this, you know, lovely feelings when they are. <laughs> we don't threaten them. <laughs> we don't and, threaten them yeah. with the removal of our love. The only times that we remove, remove ourselves from spending time with a person is when they have been unloving to us. So, you know, we, we have no levels of control whatsoever. And anybody who comes to visit us pretty much sees that. But if you look at what the media does, the word cult has a connotation. So it's not just a statement of truth for the media. Mm -hmm. It's actually a way to give an impression to a reader does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's a purposeful manipulation of the truth. A judgment is like this. A purposeful manipulation of the truth to inflame an emotion mm. in the reader in this case. Mm -hmm. for, for example, in many um, newspaper articles, I'm referred to as Miller, right? In other words, uh, I don't even uh, have the respect enough of the person in the new, who's writing the article to use my first name. I don't, I'm never usually called Mr. Miller or, or Mr. Alan John Miller or whatever, but rather I'm just called Miller, you know, like... And this is another judgment coming out of them. So the statement of my name is just a statement of truth. Yeah. My last name happens to be Miller, right? Yeah. But the attitude coming out of them is I do not deserve any sense, form of respect, which is how they feel. Mm -hmm. And that's how they treat me when they interview me, and that's exactly how they feel. And so the, the emotion coming out of them is an emotion of judgment coming out of them. And it helps a person maintain their own arrogance, their own position. It helps them maintain the feeling that they are superior. You know, so, so they feel then the right to pull down another. So, so the new, the new people that we've met in the media thus far, and I'm not saying that all people in the media are potentially like that, but we haven't met anybody that isn't at this point, but they have this strong desire to pull down all the time to and and in fact we see this happening with other people all the time and then and then of course they write these big articles pulling down something but when they're proven to be false and they've been sued or something like that for being false they write this little tiny correction in the you know in the 28th page of the paper that nobody can see yes. when they spent the whole front page pulling down the person um, and this is an indication of their underlying desire their underlying desire is one to judge but not to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. and, and a person who has a desire to tell the truth would tell the truth whether they were happy about the truth or not. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, so, you know, if, if a person came and examined our lives, they'd see that we don't rip people off, we don't impose our feelings upon them, we don't, you know, do any of those things. And while they personally might be unhappy about that because it makes their, their story a lot less flamboyant and and uh, and a lot less you know inflammatory and um, they would still be happy to tell the truth yeah and the reality is that's what judgment does judgment helps us avoid the truth mm -hmm. judgment is a great way to to step away from truth to to get away with actions that are very very damaging to society and individuals just because we want to maintain a position of falsehood most of the time. Right, because my next question was, what what makes us judge it? 
not just judge others, but judge ourselves. I see many people have an issue with judgment and criticism of self. So what drives us to this injury? Well, have, have, uh, as for all of these injuries, most of them began in our childhood in some way. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and it can be a combination of things that, that gathered in our childhood that caused us to begin to judge others. Sometimes a family has this perception that their family is the best family. And then because they maintain this perception with their children, they actually inculcate into their children this concept that our family is better than any other family and our beliefs are better than anybody else's beliefs and the way we live our life is better than any, the way anybody else lives their life. That makes us better people, mm -hmm. right? There's this underlying feeling that, that is present. Now, this underlying feeling builds in the child and, and they begin to then act upon this underlying feeling that they are better than other people. And, of course, they will not avoid judging other people as a result. Mm -hmm. The other part, the other thing that causes judgment is almost the entire opposite uh, set of circumstances in our childhood, mm -hmm. which is a, a set of circumstances where other people have judged us in our childhood and criticised us and pulled us down and denigrated us and, and treated us badly. And then this causes us to have sort of like this rebellious attitude towards their judgment by judging them in return, by, by having a kickback reaction to their judgment. And so we grow up uh, actually judging the things that are inside of ourselves mm. uh, as a result. In addition, in our childhood, we were often judged uh, whenever we expressed an emotion. Mm -hmm. So whenever we expressed an emotion that was out of harmony with the family or society viewpoint that was surrounding us at the time, we are immediately attacked. And so judgment actually comes from a, a large degree of fear inside of us about attack, mm. personal attack upon ourselves. When we are attacking another, we get away from being attacked ourselves. And if we, as a group, attack another, mm -hmm. we have a large degree of acceptance in the group mm -hmm. towards ourselves not being attacked. Mm -hmm. And so often judgment comes from a deep underlying fear of actually our own attack, our own lack of safety, our own lack of security. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And you see this happening all the time in the world too, where eventually judgment turns into um, war, eventually. Yeah. You know, and all through the Dark Ages, judgment turned into religious persecution, yeah. for example because eventually they, they turned around into this viewpoint that, that I, because I now judged you, I could now condemn you. Mm. So it's like I could now mete out justice, what I believed was my form of justice towards you. Mm. So, so if, if you happen to be speaking to spirits and I heard you and I was a religious persecutor at the time, I would have condemned you as a witch and, and given you, you know, one way to test it and the way would end up in your death mm. uh, if you were if you were innocent, and if you weren't innocent, you'd be c killed anyway. Mm. <laughs> Not very much of a choice, no. um, but but you know that that would be the judgment that I made out. So once we actually get involved in judging another. We actually also get involved in condemning another, and it's not very far from that before we will begin murdering others, mm. where we will actually be involved in harming physically other people. It's quite sobering. Yeah. And, um, yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose it, what we need to do is look at how it relates to humility. It's it, my next The question. whole reason why we're doing this is we are avoiding our own feelings about others attacking us and we're avoiding our own feelings of superiority that we have over other people and we're in, in the end avoiding our own feelings of how lesser we feel our own sense of worth and so there's so many emotions that we're avoiding and and getting away with just by judging somebody yeah all right final question on this um, block how does judgment relate to our seeing and speaking truth well Fear and truth are complete polar opposites. So fear is false expectations masquerading as truth, mm -hmm. right? Or you could say false expectations appearing real. They are masquerading as truth. 
And truth is completely the opposite. Truth is divine truth, absolute, unable to be modified. Now, judgment is a fear-based emotion. So while I'm in a state of maintaining a fear-based emotion, it's impossible for me to see truth. So this is what judgment also causes us to do. It causes us to not be able to see truth. Mm. Uh, so, so it's very, very damaging. Now, if we think about our relationship with God, we've got humility as the foundation of our relationship with God. F humility opens the door to truth. So if we're judging, we're closing the door to truth. So, so we might be praying to God, like, please give me more love. But while I'm judging my fellow man... I said in the first century, you might as well grab you know, a noose and put it around your neck and attach it to a great big heavy weight and throw it in the sea because that's really what you're doing. You're killing yourself mm. in terms of your own relationship with God. That's what you're doing by judging another person. You are actually causing the other person harm, but in addition, you're, you're causing your own soul to close to any truth. And when you cause your own soul to close to any truth, how can love ever enter? So if, if humility is the doorway to truth and truth is the doorway to love, then we were not even getting to the point of the truth mm -hmm. when we're in a state of judgment. Mm -hmm. We're already telling ourselves the lie. And so it's impossible for new truth to enter us and impossible for God's love to enter us while we're judging our fellow man mm -hmm. and, 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 and woman, of course. <laughs> so So... Judgment helps us avoid our own fear. It helps us stay away from the truth about how we feel. And it helps us avoid the personal responsibility for our own emotional response to what is happening. Mm. It helps us avoid all of those things. So, so it's like, it's anti-humility, yeah. this, uh, this, this judgment. We notice, as you and I talk about frequently, we notice many people who think they're on the divine love path judging other people so much. They, they have these terrible feelings that they feel towards people in the community or in the environment. And this is an indication of how much they do not understand the principles of humility. Yeah. Because if they understood the principles of humility, they'd be looking at themselves and going, wow, I just judged another person. Wow, I just judged another person. Wow, every time I'm judging these other persons, I am completely shut down to the truth. Completely. That's and and I see many people supposedly speaking truth, and yet they're in a state of judgment. Exactly. And as we've just described, so that, they are that totally shut down. The truth is completely closed. <laughs> exactly. And what I find so sombering about judgment is is the as you um, pointed out is the quick progression into violence that can happen from yes. judgment. Yes. Yeah. And um, well, you, you were in your first century life. You were, you know. Many of the so-called friends that we have, uh, because of their judgment of you, treated you very badly, both while I was alive, but even worse when I passed. Mm. And many of those people, you know, acted like they were all loving, yeah. but you put them in a negative situation, immediately they resort to violence, and so much violence that they're prepared to even kill a person generally, yeah. or rape them, or and lots of other uh, very unloving acts come from this underlying condition of judgment. Mm. So, for instance, men who judge women as being a slut or a whore will often revert to the rape of the same kind of a woman yeah. um, just, just because their emotion of judgment causes them to eventually revert to violence. To justify that situation. To justify it, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. thanks, babe. Um, all right, next on my list is um, it's about denial. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've written intellectual and emotional denial of unloving thoughts, words and actions as a resistance to humility. So can we say both with the intellect mm -hmm. and emotion? Mm -hmm. So what are the ways that we commonly use to live in denial? Well, we could, we could list hundreds of them probably, but there are three primary ones that I feel are so popular and common <laughs> that you could refer to them all the time. The, fir the first one is uh, a feeling of justification of our own behaviour. Mm -hmm. so, so where we justify the behaviour, usually because somebody else did it to us. So, so, so for example, you hurt me, so I, I, that gives me the right to hurt you. You know, you you damaged me, or you damaged some of my property, so that gives me the right to damage yours. Yeah. 
you stole from me, so that gives me the right to steal from you. Okay. Yeah, or I can think of some where uh, f- amongst women, like uh, she had an abortion, I had an abortion. Everyone does it. Everyone it's, does it. And we are denying the, the yep. emotions. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so justification is a, is a large way of denying emotion. Sure. And intellectual justification causes emotional denial. Um, then there's, you could say, the minimisation is another thing that we do. And when we say minimising, we say, oh, it wasn't that bad. Like, we often do this with our childhood. We say, yeah, mum and dad, you know, they weren't always loving, but it wasn't that bad. Uh, while we're carrying around mountains of emotional... Uh, you know, baggage, yeah. we often will say that. But it wasn't that bad, they were fine. And in fact, when we minimise, we can never get to the underlying causal emotion. So we, we're never, you know, it's obvious when we justify that we're never going to get there because we're actually justifying unloving behaviour. But when we minimise the unloving behaviour, we're also never going to get the causal emotion to the depth that we need to in order to clear it. Mm-hmm. So, so for the majority of people, they go into this place of... Uh, of minimising what has happened to them, minimising what they have done as well. Mm. So, so you know, explaining to themselves, yeah, it wasn't that bad, it was only a little thing. You know, you see this a lot when people steal, you know, like, yeah, yeah it was only... Oh, it was only from the government, you know, like yeah. that kind of attitude. Um, you know, I wouldn't steal from you, <laughs> but I'll falsify my tax return. Yeah. You know, th- there's this uh, underlying viewpoint that uh, some things are acceptable, mm-hmm. right? And then the, the third one that we use, I feel, just as often as that is this shifting the blame. Sort of like you often see this when a person's in a discussion with another person about something that's gone wrong in a relationship, for example. You'll say, but you did this. And it's sort of like sometimes the but you did this is something completely unrelated. Yes, <laughs> Do you know yes. what I mean? And most of the time completely unrelated <laughs> to the discussion. Yeah. But, but we, what we try to do is we try to pull the focus of attention off of ourselves mm-hmm. and onto another thing. Um, and we use that as a way to avoid ourselves, avoid what's really going on in ourselves. So this sort of justification, minimisation, shifting the blame is, are great tools that we use. And I feel that's all a part of denial. These are all the methods we use to remain in complete denial of any unloving behaviour, any unloving thoughts, any unloving words and any unloving behaviour that we have is all maintained by this denial of it, by, by justifying, minimising and shifting the blame. We, we maintain this position so that we don't have to come face to face with ourselves. Yeah. But humility is all about coming face to face with yourself. So while you're in this state of denial, shifting the blame, you are never going to come face to face with yourself. Yeah, yeah. So that's denying ourselves. What about when we deny God and God's laws? Does this indicate a lack of humility? Of course, even and an even greater lack of humility in a lot of ways. Like, imagine if 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 there is a God and there and God has all of these laws in place in the universe, and I am working through this universe in complete denial of them all. Then obviously my life is going to illustrate the denial of them. You know, in a lot of ways, the things that are happening in my life will show me that I am denying them. My soul will be putting, creating all of these fires, of course, that I'll be running around madly trying to put out. But also, I'm I'm in a state of arrogance. I'm in a state of saying, I'm lawless. I don't need God's laws, and and in fact, not honouring any of God's laws in any way. And, and, and this is an underlying denial of certain emotion. And the emotion is an emotion of rebellion, <laughs> like yeah. wanting to rebel against the very person who created us is, is a strong, angry-based desire. And, and while I'm in denial of anything, that's what I'm doing. I'm really, I'm really in this state of rage yeah. towards all of God's laws and God's principles. And, of course, that's never going to have a very good outcome. Well, what is the outcome? What, how does it affect us when we deny God and God's laws? Well, f- well, I suppose there are some things you could say it affects the outcome in a very basic way. So, for example, while I'm denying all of God's laws and denying God h- herself, I'm also um, in a state where I'm never going to live in harmony with any of God's laws. And there's a high likelihood I'll avoid developing a desire to live in harmony with love. So, you know, we've talked to many people who they love to hear what we're saying to them, 
but they don't want to act upon it. And the main reason why they don't want to act is they say to us, unless you can prove that you're Jesus, I'm not going to do any of this. And I go, well, that's a very strange position. What you're basically telling me, that unless I can prove that I'm Jesus to you, to, to, to well enough, that you're not going to act in a more loving way. Mm. Now, that seems to me to be a very illogical thing to do, to actually decide to not act in a more loving way just because you don't know whether somebody is who they're saying they are mm -hmm. is a very illogical viewpoint. In addition, it, it gives them a justification for not acting lovingly. Right? Now, why would you want a justification for not acting lovingly? There's got to be some pretty dark emotions in a person who's willing to justify just for one reason, such as, how can you prove you're Jesus? No, so therefore I'm not going to become more loving. Yeah. Like that seems to me to be a preposterous sort of uh, supposition that you're going to now say just because I can't prove my identity at this point that that means that you're, you've got the right to be unloving. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is where I feel denial has a huge impact upon people on the planet where they can't even reason logically anymore that the thing they're in denial of is, is not logical yeah. to, to stay in denial of it. It's not logical... From any perspective on this planet, it is not logical to become more lo to, to to resist becoming more loving. It's not logical. It's not logical to resist more truth. It's just not logical, and it's not logical to place whether you're going to do something in the hands of another person. Right? That's not logical either. No. And yet people do that all the time because they're in denial. Yeah. They don't want to have some kind of physical action that they have to take in order to become more loving themselves. The reality is they don't want to come face to face with the fact that they like being unloving. Mm. And they're in complete denial of that. Yeah. And they'd rather come up with a hundred excuses as to why they should remain unloving. And one of those excuses can be, oh, but you're not Jesus, or, one, or you haven't proved that you're Jesus. So what? <laughs> There's still a good reason for you to be loving. Yeah. <laughs> There's still a good reason for you to discover more truth, yeah. whether I'm Jesus or not. Yeah. And, and it makes no logical sense for a person to take a position of denial except that they wish to remain unloving. They wish to get away with tra treating other people badly. They wish to. And, and so I feel denial is a very strong thing going on on the planet. You know that discussion that we had denial and addictions with the U people in the USA recently? Mm -hmm. it, when I started listing the different issues and problems, one of the issues and problems that came up was uh, I started listing the abortion statistics from our spirit world perspective. Of course, I didn't say that in the presentation. I started listing statistics about abortion. Now, of course, many of the people went home and started looking up the statistics about abortion. Then I got this whole list of emails saying how I was incorrect about the statistics on abortion and so forth. And to be frank, I was not. Mm. The statistics on abortion are taken only from the fact of recorded abortions in developed societies. Mm -hmm. In addition, they do not include any abortive forms of contraception. Mm -hmm. right? When you add all of the abortive forms of contraception and all of the desires of parents to not have children and all of the actual abortions that do actually occur, there are, there are, there are actually more than 500 million pregnancies on this planet every single year. Right? Not 144 million, which is the childbirth rate on the planet every year. So what happened to the rest of those children? Well, they all died mm. from abortions and miscarriages, mm. right? Whether we call them abortions or miscarriages or not, they all died from that. And so when I'm speaking with our spirit friends, I'm saying well, how many people pass in the spirit world every single year from an act from their parents that was abortive in nature? They say 250 million. When we look at the statistics on the planet of how many abortions actually occur in every single year, it's 40-something million, 45 million. Mm -hmm. right? Very different figures. Mm. Right? But then why are we even justifying 45 million mm. children dying from abortion every year? Mm. 
you know, we're, we're meant to be in societies that love children, mm -hmm. but before the child exits the womb, we're perfectly happy to kill it. Mm. Like, is there something wrong here? Mm. Of course there is. Mm. That's the point. Mm. There is something wrong here. And, and this, is a, this is the underlying problem is most of us are in complete denial that most of us in Western societies do approve, or many people do approve of abortion, which is actually approving of a murder, mm -hmm. right? Without seeing the results in the spirit world of what actually occurs to these children, we're actually approving of something because we want to maintain our denial. Mm -hmm. Why do we want to maintain our denial? Because by maintaining our denial, we get to have the right to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. That's which, why we want to do it. Which is about avoiding a fear in the end. Which is about avoiding a fear. Mm -hmm. Like we're, 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 all sorts of fears, mm -hmm. if you list them all. You mm -hmm. know, I think in our discussion on abortion that I did the interview with, with Barbara um, recently, I listed some of those fears that, you know, that we have uh, that cause us to go ahead with an abortion. But the reality is none of us want to face those fears and so what do we finish up doing it? We can finish up going into complete denial that the unborn child is a child mm -hmm. and we start and, and then we start having to make a choice. So is it three months that it's a child or six months of pregnancy it's a child or when can we allow an abortion and not allow an abortion? And all of these choices are made because we're in complete denial of the fact that this is a child. Mm. We're in complete denial of the fact of the truth. We don't have to face the truth. And we don't have to face the truth of how many abortions are actually occurring. We don't have to face the truth of our own unloving behaviour. And yet, when the child is born, what lengths do we go through to save the child if it's sick? Extreme. Extreme lengths. Like, something's wrong here. <laughs> you know, logically, something's wrong. Yeah. Do you feel that that denial, if you take that issue, for example... Is that are we denying something that we inherently feel inside of ourselves, or are, is the world itself in a state of denial that doesn't actually bring allow enough truth to come to us about these sorts of issues? Well, in the end, all of these things are personally attributable to our own emotional condition. But yeah. we must understand that that our own emotional condition is a result of often the environment in which we're living. So, if the world itself believes, pardon me, that that a child is not a child until it's born, mm -hmm. then of course I'm going to grow up having that same belief, mm -hmm. which will then cause me to uh, you know, have a certain set of justifications. However, any mother who has been pregnant and who has then lost a child through a miscarriage mm -hmm. often feels they've lost a child. Yes. And yet when they've lost a child through abortion, they don't believe the child is a child. Mm. And this in itself is the level of denial that we have. Mm. We are willing to explain one condition, right, and yet explain a completely opposite condition and, and be in complete denial that we're talking about exactly the same thing almost yeah. uh, at the same time. Yeah. And this is an indication of how much our intellectual denial causes us to avoid emotional causes within us. And the reality is, yes, we do have, you know, society does collectively have certain conditions which are completely against the acknowledgement of truth on a particular issue. Because uh, uh, we're speaking a lot about abortion, but I suppose this counts for very many other issues that we don't even, we don't even see, uh, abortion is an issue that is brought up as a moral issue on mm. the planet. Mm -hmm. But I suppose um, there's many issues that we don't even question because the whole world is in a global sense of denial about Yeah, well, it. let's look at another, the eating of meat. Mm. That is more of a global issue. You know, the majority of people on the planet are completely for the eating of meat. Most uh, me in the medical profession promote the eating of it. They believe that for, for health, if you look at almost any society on the planet, we're willing to greatly destroy our environment for the sake of eating meat. We, we, we have ten times the amount of economic... Uh, of destruction occurring to the planet and also re economic resources required to produce this meat than if everybody was ve vegetarian on the planet. And yet and yet, we all were in denial of all of that. And, and why are we all in denial of that? Because many of us like to eat meat. That's, mm. that's the main reason we're in denial of it all. And, and so from a society perspective, we can maintain this denial. Mm. Many people who have listened to the divine truth for, for years are still have not dealt with this moral issue yeah. because they are in complete denial. Yeah. 
of the fact that they're being unloving. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're being unloving to the animals themselves, but they're also being unloving to the earth. They're being unloving to the rainforests, which are being destroyed at phenomenal rates just for the sake of beef, beef production. They're being unloving to the earth itself and the, and the earth's resources because we could be using 10 times less resources for food production than we're currently using. And, and all the while they're complaining about how the earth's being destroyed. Mm. That what hypocrisy is there yeah. if, if a person is complaining about how the earth is being destroyed and yet at the same time eating meat they are hypocrite it's quite simple right and so, that is not a judgment that is just a statement of truth yes. because they are hypocrite because on one hand they are destroying the earth and on the other hand they're complaining about other people doing it <laughs> and that's hypocrisy yeah. that's the statement of hypocrisy the key is for us to work through the emotional reason why we want to maintain that denial and a lot of that's to do with our family. Because as soon as, as you know, as soon as you go vegetarian, who's the first people who complain? <laughs> well, my family didn't because they were vegetarian oh, when God. I was a kid. But yeah. for many people, it is the mother... My mother still complains. How can you eat? How can you survive? How can you get enough yeah. sustenance? And uh, yeah. like, I, like, I went through a period when I first became vegetarian of having to deal with lots of emotions, so I lost a lot of weight. And my mother thought, you're too skinny, it's because you're a vegetarian. Now that I've put the weight back on, is that because I'm a vegetarian? <laughs> I'm not eating meat still. Right? I'm a vegan, actually. Not eating meat still. But, uh, or any animal products. And so, and so have I put the weight back on? Because of, No, it was because of emotion. Yeah. And, and this is, a, see, it, it, in the end, our denial of the unloving act, eating meat, causes us to deny that a person who's vegan can actually be completely healthy. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And this is where I feel denial is such a powerful tool that we use on this planet to manipulate and control and, and, and direct the opinions of the entire world. Yeah. Um, mm. And also from what you're saying, it, it helps us become hypocrites. But then I looked at your list of things we've already got so far and it seems like all of these resistances to humility actually breed hypocrisy. They do, yes. Yeah. Like if you look at arrogance, when I have a viewpoint, like for example, that oh, my race is better than yours, I'm a hypocrite because the reality is I'm not looking at the truth. The reality is I can procreate with, with your race. So that makes us both the same. Mm -hmm. We can have a child if we, have, if, we, if we make love. We can have a child and we're from different races then. We're both the same, you know. And so there's the proof. There's the proof that my arrogance is also uh, the, the, of my arrogance, but it's also the proof of my hip, hip, hypocrisy, hypocrisy yeah. like in terms of my belief system. It's the same with all of these different things. They all create hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And that's why we gave that talk recently in London, was it? We're to that small group of yes. people about sincerity or hypocrisy, you know, yeah. which one are we going to choose? Because there's so many people who believe they're hearing divine truth, they believe they're following it, but it's not actually transforming their life. They yeah. find it even difficult to feel an emotion still, to be frank. Yeah. And, and the reason why is because they still want to maintain these facade-based hypocritical actions. Yeah. Mm. yeah. All right. Uh, on denial, my last, uh, my last question was, it was really the observation that most of us, when we embark on this endeavour to know ourselves and to know God, we seem to realise we're all in bucket loads of denial. And we've talked a little bit about our investment in denial, but my last question for you was, do you think the world is invested in us staying in denial? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, if you look at politi politics, it's invested in the denial of what it's doing. Religion is divested in the denial of what it's doing. And, and if we look at almost any other area of endeavour, the medical profession, all these other areas, there's, there's huge amounts of denial in all of it. A lot of it is to create a seeming uh, idea of prosperity, which obviously isn't the case because many people in the world don't mm. have any prosperity at all. Mm. And so, you know, we've just been to Brazil where there's favelas, uh, you know, the, um, everywhere. and. Yeah. Um, you know, while some people have improved in their condition, there's huge amounts of denial about what's happening to the environment and, and you know, just for the sake of, of the improvement in economic prosperity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there, there is this uh, huge layers of denial in every aspect of life. And, and like we've been even, it, even now our own involvement with the media has been interesting because we often get people emailing us saying, the media always tells the truth. And we go, what? Like, 
there's not been a single instance where the media has told the truth about us. Like, and how can they believe that the media tells the truth? The poor media's lost all credibility <laughs> with me now because I know how many lies they've told about us. I look at anything and I think, I really, I really can't believe what's yeah. being said. But can you see if I maintain the denial that the media is not lying to me or the government is not lying to me or religion is not lying to me or whatever it is that is not lying to me, then I don't have to feel anything. Yeah. I don't have to feel the disappointment, the lack of trust, the other emotions that I do not want to feel. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so what, I, what do I do? I choose to believe the, what is being touted as the, the mainstream viewpoint and I, I choose to believe it because I want to avoid a whole group of emotions about it. So you're really saying that even though, yes, the world is invested in us remain, remaining in denial, individuals are creating that investment. Exactly, exactly. It's got nothing to do with the world. The world is not some kind of inanimate object, you know, of people. It's not some inanimate object over which we have no bearing. Yeah. It, it, it is completely responding in the way that it is because the majority of individuals in the world want to maintain a position of denial. The majority of individuals in the world do not want to believe that their politicians are lying to them. They don't want to believe that their religions are telling them untruth. They don't want to believe that, uh, you know, all these other areas, the economic areas and other areas of their life are all just a figment of some somebody's imagination uh, or, or some somebody's very, you know, highly male malevolent control issues. They don't want to believe all of those things. They'd much rather believe that everything's fine. Mm. And if I can believe that everything's fine, then, then um, you know, I don't have to feel anything bad. Yeah. Now, if everyone in the world feels like, oh, we just want to believe everything's fine, then, of course, the politicians and the religious leaders and all the other people just say, everything's fine, everything's <laughs> fine, everything's fine. And we go, oh, everything's fine, isn't this wonderful? When it's not fine, and, and the irony is, if we look around the world today, we can see everything's not fine, and yet we still want to believe everything's fine. And, and, and this is like, you know, the old saying about the ostrich burying its head in the sand, want to believe everything's fine when it's not. We don't want to, and we do that because we don't want to come face to face with our own emotions. Yeah. That's the only reason why we're doing it. Yeah. It's not because we're not capable of changing, because we are. Mm -hmm. Where it's not because we're not capable of bringing our life into more harmony with love, because we are. It's because we do not want to face our own negative emotions that are needed to face before we do those things. Yeah, yeah. So it's all about facing our own pain. We want to avoid our own pain, yeah. which is a very selfish, self-oriented perspective of our life. And it's where we lose integrity, isn't it? We as lose everything. We... Courage, integrity, you know, any sense of love, truth, everything. We lose any quality that is good in human nature as soon as we stay in denial and, and, and as soon as we want to avoid our own emotional condition and as soon as we want to avoid our own emotional pain. Yeah. Yeah. And remember, being humble is about accepting your own emotional condition, be accepting your own emotional pain, accepting how you feel. Mm. That's what humble humility is all about. Mm. I need to take a short break. Yes, yeah. I do too. Okay. So let's, let's do, do that. that. Just Okay, back from our little break. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. It's all the water we drink, darling. Yeah. <laughs> Can't last more than an hour and a half. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it's good to be back in the vicinity of a regular, uh, uh, easily accessible toilet, toilet yeah. when we're travelling so much. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, so on to our next point of resistance to mm -hmm. humility. Mm -hmm. Anger with others. Anger. My first question about anger mm -hmm. is that if humility is actually about feeling all of our emotions, mm -hmm. how, can I, how can our anger with others indicate a lack of humility? Yes, a lot of people believe that uh, they have the right to experience their anger, and of course they do. Um, we, we, but the reality is we can be angry and not sin, as the Bible says. Mm -hmm. The way we do that is by actually owning the anger as an, as an emotion inside of ourselves that we refuse to direct at another person. Most people, though, with their anger, they use anger as a tool to direct at other people. And as a result, they are nowhere near experiencing any emotion. 
they are actually in the state of abusing the state of anger and actually using their anger to destroy uh, things around them, including other people. Anger um, is, a, is an indication, and unless the anger is a childlike anger, and the way a child experiences anger, if we go over that again, is it just has a little tantrum laying on the ground, kicking and screaming and usually crying, right, mm. along with it. Mm. It doesn't expect anything from... When, it, when the child is in a pure state of anger, it doesn't expect anything from its environment. It doesn't go up and hit anybody, for example. If the child is going up to hit somebody, then it's now not experiencing its anger. It's now actually acting upon its anger and abusing other people. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very different to experiencing anger. When a child is in a pure place of experiencing anger, it just, like I said, jumps up and down and feels the anger inside of itself. Now, the majority of people who are in anger are not doing that. The majority of people who are in anger are actually projecting their anger, forcing their anger upon other people. This is an indication that they have addictions that are not being met. And addictions cover over fears and cover over grief. Now, if we're in a state of anger, this is telling us actually that we are in a state far removed from our actual emotional condition. Mm -hmm. That means that we're far removed from humility. Mm. Every time we get angry as an adult, we are far removed generally from humility. It's when we experience a childlike sense of anger that is, con that is contained within us and not expressed outwardly to other people in the environment. That is when we're in a pure state of feeling some causal anger. Yeah. The rest of the time when we're angry, we are just in an effect of wanting our addictions met and them not being met. We are, in it, we're in, we are in the effect of our maintaining our own addictions and then wanting the world to actually give us the addictions, to, uh, to give us what, what we want. So would you make a distinction then between anger and anger with others? Is, is it when I'm angry with you that I'm not humble, but when I'm experiencing my anger, I would be humble? Sure. Is but that the, simplifying it too much? Well, I, no, I think it's a nice, simple way of looking at it. But the majority of people, when they hear that, um, won't understand, understand the it. difference. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of times when people on the planet uh, experience anger, it is usually experienced towards another person. Sure. Or, or towards a situation that involves other persons. And as a result of that, is it, it's an indication that their addictions are not getting met. It's got nothing to do with underlying causal emotions. Now, I'm not saying you don't feel it. I'm, what I'm saying is don't act upon it. Mm -hmm. Don't act upon your rage and use your rage as a justification for harming another person. So, for example, mm -hmm. <clears throat> even going up to another person and saying, I was angry with you, you've got to question the reason why a person would do that. Mm. like why do they have to tell you that you're angry with you they were angry with you if they were truly experiencing their anger they wouldn't need to do that mm. the fact that they are doing it is because they want some level of control over you mm. they want to make you feel like they've been angry with you and why would they want that they want that because they want to make you feel something mm. about their anger that you are they feel that you are to blame for it so the, the reality is anger directed at other uh, externally is always a result of an addiction not being met. It's always the result of an underlying emotional condition that we're in denial of. Because if we weren't in denial of it, we wouldn't be getting angry with the other person. So it's always out of harmony with humility and therefore out of harmony with truth. And therefore, in that state, we can't expect to receive God's love. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what does it show us about our emotional condition? You've touched on that, but is there anything... Well, it's an indication. Our anger is an indication of our own personal justification that other people are to blame for any personal pain that, I, that we experience. Mm -hmm. In other words, what we're really saying is that we are not capable of experiencing our own personal pain without causing personal pain in another. 
That's really what we're doing when we get angry. What we're doing is we're telling the world around us and ourselves that other people deserve to have pain if we are in pain. Mm. And this is a very, very damaging action. In fact, it causes almost every single negative thing that happens on this planet is caused by this underlying justification that if I am in personal pain, then I have the right to also create personal pain for you. Yeah. Yep. And this is not uh, this is not not true, and it also is a is a, it's grossly unloving, and in in addition, it is a demonstration of our own lack of humility. In other words, our own lack or our own lack of desire to actually feel our own pain without harming another person. Mm. Why is it that we have to f have to harm another person when we are in pain? It's because we are in denial of our own pain and we believe we are justified in creating pain for others when we have pain and we are not justified in doing so. So say I'm an angry person mm -hmm. and I, I hear you saying these things, mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm justifying these things. Mm -hmm. What are the steps I would take? Um, what do I need to let go of in order to let go of anger? Well, firstly, we, it's a process, obviously. Firstly, we have to see the addictions we are in. We also then, after, we need to feel these addictions as errors, not as things that we want satisfied, but we have to see them as errors, things that are creating our own unhappiness, actually, in the long run. Secondly, we have to see that every single addiction that we have that creates our anger when it's not met actually covers over the fear that we have inside of ourselves that we're in denial of mm. and we need to allow ourselves at some point to get to a state of allowing ourselves to see the fears that we are, are in denial of once we go through that phase as a feeling phase then we'll get to the stage of what has grieved us in the past and it is usually what has grieved us in the past that causes us to act out of anger in the future or in the present and so what we need to do is understand that we are just avoiding terrible emotions of grief that we need to allow ourselves to feel without damaging other people. Now, if we're prepared to go through that fa those phases, then we'll very quickly get out of a state of anger and into a state of fear. But as you know from your own experience, it's not always that easy because we have huge addictions involved in our rage. Mm -hmm. We want to be angry. We want to justify it. We have all this arrogance about it as well generally. We want to, we're in denial of the fact that we, it's an emotion inside of ourselves. We always believe somebody else has made us angry or the situation has caused us to be angry. Mm -hmm. not understanding that these are all things that are going on inside of ourselves. And the reality is there are some circumstances where we are attacked and we feel that is unfair. And as a result of our feeling that it's unfair and our denial of our own grief of the unfairness, mm. we then go on the attack ourselves. And, and so a lot of times it's our, it's our resistance to feeling the grief of unfair actions perpetrated towards ourselves that then cause us to maintain a rage towards others. Mm -hmm. So you see this happening a lot in relationships where a woman might have been treated badly in the past in her relationships. She now, she now has this viewpoint of men that all men are bastards. Like, mm -hmm. There's not a good one on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is an untruth, but besides being an untruth, it's a, maintain, it's a maintenance of her own rage. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to feel the pain of these unfulfilled and unhappy past relationships. Rather, she's now projecting the past onto her present and future. She's now actually determining that all people are the same as the people she's already met. Mm. And this is, a, besides being illogical, another thing that always happens when we're in denial of the true emotions, mm -hmm. um, it's also very unloving because we're projecting upon other people things that may not exist inside of them. We're not giving them the opportunity to, to demonstrate the truth at all. Mm -hmm. uh, people do this with you and I all the time, as you know, where mm -hmm. you know they, they automatically assume because I'm saying I'm Jesus that I'm saying that I'm better than them, for example. It's not a valid assumption. It's not what I feel. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but it's what they assume. Mm -hmm. 
and they then automatically get angry about that. So sometimes we receive very nasty emails from people who are not even religious condemning me for saying that I'm Jesus. And they don't even believe in Jesus, many of them, and they're condemning me for saying I'm Jesus because they feel that by saying I'm Jesus, I'm saying that I'm better than them, and they feel very angry about that, mm. which means that they actually feel that they are worse than, than Jesus mm. and, and, and they're unwilling to feel the extent of how bad they actually feel about themselves. Um, it's got nothing to do with my feelings about them because my feelings are as I love them and I, that's the whole reason why I give the truth the way we do is because we love them. So, so you know, it's not our feelings but, but it's interpreted. And this is the problem with our rage is that we are often interpreting the present based on past experience and we are way out of harmony when we do this with love. Yeah, that was a very... Um, uh important and beautiful thing you said I think just a little while ago that often it's the pain that we haven't felt from the past that causes us to justify the anger in the present and the future yeah and so that seems to be a crucial kind of um truth to to allow to enter us that wow I'm angry and it must be because there's stuff there in my from the past that, yeah. I, that I'm not humble to. Anger does not get created in an individual when there is stuff that has all been felt in the past. Yeah. So, so for example, if a, if a child has been harmed in its past and then it was allowed to grieve all of that harm, then it would no longer be angry. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that if I am angry, you know, as a, as a person or, 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 or often ang even just occasionally angry or frustrated as a person, it has to do with something that has occurred in my past. And, and the present circumstance or situation that we believe has made us angry is just a, a law of attraction event based on our condition to help us expose the emotion from the past yes. that, is, that has caused me to be in this state. And the only reason why I am angry is because I am in denial of that emotion from the past. Mm. And usually that emotion is fear or, and, and grief, like huge amounts of grief generally. And I'm, I'm in fear of the grief and that's what creates my anger. And, and in addition, uh, so I suppose you could say that there are two primary creators of my rage. The first primary creator is my desire to have my addiction met. And when the addiction is not met I, and I expect it to be met, then I get angry. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Secondly, the, the addiction is present because of a denial of fear and grief. Mm -hmm. And if I allow myself to go to this fear and grief, if I was truly humble and didn't have this resistance of anger towards humility, mm -hmm. I would allow myself to go into this feeling of grief, which would allow me then to release the underlying reason why I created the addiction in the first place. Mm -hmm. And once those addictions have gone and the grief is gone, then I will not get angry about the same situation ever again. It's probably difficult for people to to recognise that as a truth, mm. but uh, mm. I certainly see that um, in yourself and and beginning to see that happen for myself, yes. which is exciting. Well, you, you've seen me treat, treated unjustly many times mm -hmm. and... and when I, I just go allow myself to go into my, most of the time allow myself to go into my um, grief about that. Yeah. And as a result of that, I don't feel angry towards the people who've treated me badly mm -hmm. at all. And, and so, you know, you can see that if a person allows themselves to go into a state of grief about the situation and uh, rather than getting into a rage about the situation and, just, and, and justifying their rage, um, then, then it makes the person a much more softer individual, much more loving individual. And in every circumstance, even in the most harshest of circumstances, a person in that state can, can always be kind and considerate and loving. What about people who say that anger is a healthy emotion because it causes change, it causes us to stand up for ourselves? It, how, how do you relate this, this anger that we're talking about to what they're talking about? Are they speaking about anger? Do they have a? I'm asking too many questions. Well, yeah, all, all anger is healthy in the sense in the sense that if we feel our anger, then we will be healthy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in the sense in the sense that we need to feel all of our emotions to be healthy. However, projected at other people, it is not healthy, as you well know, and as everybody well knows. It creates a lot of dynamics in the world that are very, very dangerous and damaging, including wars. In fact, 
are created by this underlying feeling of societal anger from one country to another. So, so you know, the, this kind of rage is not is not healthy at all. It's caused huge amounts of damage. I, I do not believe that change motivated by rage is ever going to have a permanent benefit. Mm -hmm. Change motivated by love, humility and truth, it will always have a permanent be benefit. Now, it is true that when we come to see the truth on a certain issue, we often instantly angry. And, and this anger is an indication of how much falsehood has been present before then that we need to grieve. Mm -hmm. Now, once we grieve the fact that we were told things that were wrong, we will actually find ourselves acting in a very different manner and we will no longer find ourselves getting into a rage about things mm -hmm. as a result of accessing the grief. But often we do not access the grief until we feel the layers above. Now, the layer of anger is the layer of feelings above the addiction. The feelings of the addiction are the layer of feelings above the fear. So, so we, if a person's in total denial, then of course they are going to have to get angry in order to heal. Mm -hmm. It's how they do this anger, how they you know, express this anger in their day-to-day -day life, is to, whether it's going to be damaging to them or not. If they express it to other people and act out their anger towards other people, it is going to further damage their soul and only leave them with more anger to feel. Mm -hmm. That's all it's mm -hmm. going to do. Mm -hmm. It will not actually have a healing effect on them. For it to have a healing effect, they have to feel through the anger they have to feel the anger without harming other persons and just feel how much angry they are, just angry. You know, you can feel anger without projecting it at others. And once you feel this kind of anger, now you can get into the addiction of what the addiction is and also get into the underlying f uh, fear and grief when you allow yourself to go into it in that manner. So in that way, it can be a very healing process if you allow yourself to feel it without projecting it upon others. Mm -hmm. If you are projecting it upon others, which the majority of people do, then you are no longer in this state where you're actually healing through your anger. You are now in a state of resistance to healing. You are justifying yourself not being humble and resisting the process of healing. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is going to be very damaging to you and your future life and or anything, any relationships around you. Mm. Mm. Okay. So I feel there's a big difference between those two states. For the majority of people on the planet, they need to assume that the majority of their anger is addictive in nature rather than childlike experience. When you see a, ch a person experiencing anger as a childlike experience, you feel completely safe. Yes. When you feel the anger of people around you who are not in a childlike experience, you feel completely unsafe. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to tell whether a person is safe or unsafe experiencing their anger. If they are safe, if you feel safe when they're experiencing their anger, then it means they are not projecting it outwards. If you feel unsafe or criticised or harmed by them experiencing their anger, then now that's an indication that they are now blaming others and they are affecting others and they are damaging the souls of others and themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And the reality is the majority of the planet falls into the second category. Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay, well, um, next on my list is another heavy topic. And perhaps we need to make this our last one for this session. For this session, yeah. yeah we'll have to break in two, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, to, finish, to finish the resistances. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> okay, so the last one for today, if we talk about hatred towards others. Hatred. And I've written hatred towards others, but um, could we just to find it as hatred because we can hate ourselves as well can't we yes and hatred towards yourself is just as damaging uh, and can be very damaging to your own progression in terms of love mm -hmm. as much as hatred towards another can be so can you define hatred for us well yes hatred or resentment is usually a build-up of rage or anger to the extent mm -hmm. that we wish to harm another or ourselves now, this harm we may be causing emotionally or physically or intellectually. So, in other words, we're willing to harm another person emotionally, physically, intellectually, sexually, in any way, ourselves or another person. And that is, uh, that is an indicator that we are full of hatred. 
Now, many people have this level of hatred towards themselves, mm. where they're actually willing to harm themselves. And many also have uh, the same similar level of hatred towards others, where they're willing to harm another. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It is, uh, is ex it's, an, it's a very, very damaging emotion, obviously. It causes the degradation of the human soul very rapidly. And it unfortunately har harms other people as well as ourselves. So, so uh, for this reason, it's going to cause a lot of damage to the other people's soul as well as our own. Mm. Yeah. And certainly I see it played out all around the world and I and probably in my own life towards myself at certain times. Mm -hmm. what, what leads us to hate? Well, again, it comes from an underlying desire to avoid specific emotions, always, and usually avoid our own emotions. Um, but, but unfortunately, this desire to avoid has become so strong that we're willing to destroy things in order to avoid Mm -hmm. and we're willing to destroy others or destroy ourselves or destroy our environment because of the level of hatred that we have. So, so this is an extreme emotion that many, that many of us have in certain areas um, based around our own severe avoidance of underlying feelings that we have towards usually towards another or towards ourselves mm. so it, it's a, a very very damaging emotion to our soul progression a very damaging emotion with our relationship with God it's very interesting because you know again you and I have often received huge amounts of hatred from people who say they're on the divine love path um, so these are people who say they're receiving God's love and they say they're receiving God's truth and right at the same time they're projecting huge amounts of viciousness uh, towards us, not understanding the underlying principles that, uh, that about love. Like if we can't love our enemies, then we are no better than a murderer or, 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 a, or, or a thief mm. because they love their friends mm. but they just don't love their enemies, right? And, and if we can't love our enemies, then, then we are no better than they are, really, in the end. And when I say better, we're no, we're no more of a loving condition than a murderer or a thief, really, if we cannot love our enemies. Mm. And hatred causes us to have enemies. Mm. You know, hatred is all about enemies. We, we, we usually have enemies when we're in a state of hatred, where, where we just can't stand the sight of a person. We would love to see them die. Or we'd love to, for many women, the feeling is they'd love to see them tortured to death. <laughs> or, you know, like many men have, uh, have hatred that's explosive and very brief. Many women have hatred that ha has developed over years and years of resentment and is very, very long-standing emotion that causes them to desire to completely um, destroy somebody from an emotional perspective. And both forms of hatred are very, very damaging to the soul. So if, if we examine that, uh, the difference between men often having an explosive kind of hatred and women often, like hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, mm -hmm. like this kind of hatred that um, controls their life yep. for, for long periods of time. Yep. Can, we, can we deduct something about the nature of hatred Sure. Through that? Sure. Um, the problem for, for many men, because they have a, a masculine body that, uh, that, that also has, the, and society also has this sort of more allowance of men uh, being in a state of anger. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, one of the reasons why up until very recently women weren't allowed to go to war was because of the expression of anger that was required to go to war, uh, the expression of masculine violence that is needed. Um, and so, and so, for those reasons, there's a lot more society allowance of anger inside of men, and therefore brief explosions of hatred. There's also a lot more uh, allowance generally because the man is physical, physically larger in in nature generally than women, and physically stronger. And because of these two underlying factors, generally a man feels. Uh, more able to engage his anger in a hateful way towards another and you know physically harm them 
And so even even men are it's even promoted in a way that you know to have a bit of a dust up with another guy you know you get all your frustrations out and often that is true you know they yeah. do finish up getting many of their frustrations out and oftentimes the person they've had a good dust up with you know fisticuffs with uh, it turns out to be a great friend afterwards as a result <laughs> so, of so the release of emotion right are you saying that as women we just need to have a few more dust ups no no I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> I'm saying, but what happens with women is that many women have felt powerless for huge amounts of their life. And this ongoing powerless feeling that has occurred over long periods of time in their lives has caused resentment to build up, which is like long-term feelings of hatred to build up inside of the soul. And because there is no, again, there's no desire to release the grief of it. So, so, you see, to avoid resentment, you have to leave a situation. So, so, for example, if you were being attacked as a woman in any way, whether it was verbally or physically or whatever, the only way to avoid resenting the person who, who commits the attack is to leave the situation. Then you would grieve. If you left the situation, you would grieve. The emotion that you'd grieve, what the attack, you know, what has happened to you, and then you'd have forgiven the person. Mm. You wouldn't want to be with them anymore, but you'd forgiven them, um, and and you would have moved on with your life like um, quite quite easily. For most women, though, they stay in unloving situations for very long periods of time because they uh, have huge issues with security and safety and other other types of things, other emotions which they don't allow themselves to feel mm-hmm. in reality. And so what they do is they live in a situation that's very damaging with, with the initially the anger turning into hatred and then the hatred turning into resentment. Mm-hmm. So perhaps we need to write here, and resentment. Mm-hmm. And once the hatred turns into resentment, then we have this emotion that's inside of us where we want to plan the destruction of an individual we're not happy with them dying mm. because if they died then it would be too fast mm. we want to plan the actual emotional destruction of the individual and laugh while we're doing it mm. right? and this is the kind of resentment that exists in many women towards men in particular mm. but also towards other women sometimes and and this level or layer of resentment is so it can be can be huge now now women have it more than men because they have been suppressed more than men. Mm -hmm. Many men have been allowed to experience their anger or or brief brief explosions of anger, both from a society perspective and from their own physical condition and from their own physical nature, Mm -hmm. they're allowed to experience these particular things. But a woman is looked down upon when she has any of those kind of emotions. Mm -hmm. And so she she then suppresses those emotions much more readily and therefore experiences more of a feeling of resentment over a longer period of time. And from what you're saying, though, it relates to a sense of powerlessness that is suppressed. Yes. And so for men, they might equally have a sense of powerlessness, but they use anger to... To feel powerful. To feel powerful. Yes. Um, But women women generally don't use anger to feel power, although that's changing. You know, you see that changing rapidly in Western societies now where women are using anger to feel powerful but historically they haven't been able to do that without being harmed Mm -hmm. so it sounds like what you're saying is there's a powerless feeling whether it's in a man or a woman Mm -hmm. uh often when we're not humble to that or we can't leave a powerless situation well the reality is most people in western society can leave a powerless situation but they choose not to for other reasons Mm. so so for most women they choose to not leave the powerless situation because they're feeling a fear of their own safety or security or financial security Mm. Mm. yeah i'm thinking here more of children who are abused in a yeah that's very different obviously you know they can't leave a situation so persons who have been abused often have large levels of hatred and resentment and it's understandable that these emotions exist, but they need to be allowed to. They need to allow themselves to go through these emotions without harming other people. Yeah. So I'm thinking about that. There's powerlessness, and if we can't 
if we can't escape that sense of powerlessness, often we become angry. Very much so. And then if that's suppressed or disallowed in then itself, we become resentful. then we become resentful and hateful. So for someone who finds himself in a state of hate, is it essentially peeling back those layers? Yes. Is that what's going to have to happen for them? It's going to have to happen, but they need to do it in a, in a state where they're not attacking other people all the time. Yeah. They need to realise that these are emotions inside of themselves that due to the unfortunate circumstances of their life, they have to feel. And, and they are the only persons that can feel it. They, mm. Nobody else can feel it for them. Mm. And every time they attempt to harm another person as a result of these emotions, they are actually creating more damage to their own soul. There's, there's going to be more for them to feel if they mm. keep doing that. Yeah, and I feel for it, it's, it's unfortunate because often people who have been very harmed in this very powerless state for a long time and then had their... I'm thinking now more of people who've been abused for many years, yes. had their anger suppressed, and then they reach a state of hatred yeah. with often it becomes globalised. Yes. There's very little compassion for people in this state, isn't there? Yes. And it seems that that's what they need the most. Well, yeah, the, the, um, they do need compassion, but however, we cannot tolerate their unloving behaviour. Mm. So, so when I say tolerate it, you can't, you can't support their unloving behaviour. So we need to allow... See, if society was well, is, was well-versed in handling these particular situations, what they would do is they'd have places of recovery that, which would be supported by a large group of people so that one person doesn't feel the full brunt of this hatred or anger coming from the individual, where the person themselves who has been harmed or abused in, in their past can go through a process of firstly exposing their hatred and rage, getting into feeling it without projecting it onto others and is slowly going down into their grief. Unfortunately, because most people who have been abused do have large levels of grief to experience, there is a large layer of denial that most of them have to go through where they have huge amounts of rage or, or anger or fear associated with their grief. And, and if we were, as a society, caring about those particular issues, um, we would create environments where they can safely go through these levels of grief, uh, well, firstly, levels of hatred, rage, then seeing the addictions that they have as well and into their fears and grief. And we'd have uh, places where they could do this that support that process. And they're not always going to be places that, uh, you know, that are, um, they will be confronting places. They need mm -hmm. to be confronting places to support, to, to actually confront many of the emotions yeah. that are inside the person. But they'd also need to be supportive. This is a process of healing, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and that you can't heal without going through these particular emotional experiences. And, and if we did that, the person wouldn't be as afraid of feeling their own emotion. One of the reasons why these people who've been abused feel so uh, angry is because society generally judge them, judges the level of their rage or the level of their anger or hatred um, and therefore doesn't even allow them to experience those emotions. Mm. And, uh, and if we created a different environment, then these people could easily go through those emotions or much more rapidly go through those emotions than they currently can do. Mm. And in fact, what we do with those people generally is we medicate them. Mm. We actually suppress their emotions. We give them antidepressants or, or some other form of medication which heavily suppresses the connection with the emotional condition. And this just causes them further problems. Now they don't even feel like they have a happy life or a content life. And, you know, now there's all sorts of other problems and issues that come across. And the level of su suppressed rage, you know, causes them to suicide at much higher mm. rates and so forth you know so society's fear of these kind of emotions is so great mm. that we the people who've experienced these kind of events are not assisted at all to to heal from them just one last question i know we're running out of time mm -hmm. but um we just talked about the example of someone ending up in a place of hatred starting really at the root cause of feeling powerless mm -hmm. Uh, this week in book group we're studying through the mists and we're up to chapter 9 and it's called The Harvest of Jealousy. Mm -hmm. And in that chapter we hear the story of a woman who was actually bred with a sense... Of, she grew up with a sense of entitlement. She was very wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, a certain set of situations happened where she couldn't get her own way. 
She became very angry, but she suppressed that. And then she ended up in a state of hatred. Mm -hmm. Now, are we seeing this a different root cause, aren't we? We're seeing someone who's being challenged on an addiction, but suppressing the anger that comes from that. Is yes. that the case? Yeah. In, in the end, a lot of times uh, when we've grown up in a, an environment where we believe we have the, you know, uh, we are superior in some way, we then uh, have a large amount of addictions in, maintain, in maintaining that superiority. Mm -hmm. And these addictions then cause us to, whenever we cannot maintain the feeling of superiority, we revert to anger-based emotions. And if, those ang if that anger is suppressed, then certainly we'll revert to hatred. Mm -hmm. but, but in the end, the underlying emotion is still present, and that is the underlying emotion that I am superior to another comes from or is created from this underlying feeling that perhaps we're not superior and perhaps we're opposite to that. Um, and so, so in the end, these polar opposites of emotions often cause the same outcome mm -hmm. in an individual. So a, a person who's treated very badly as a child can grow up feeling a sense of uh, rage towards the world, but a person who's treated very well as a child when I say well, I use that term very loosely in the sense that, you know, they're given everything they want and I don't believe that is treating a child well. But a, but a parent who, tr who gives their child everything they want causes the child also to have the to, to have same kind of addictions. Mm -hmm. And it's the addictions that cause the anger mm -hmm. and it's the anger that's that suppressed that causes the, the hatred and resentment. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the anger that's suppressed causing the hatred and resentment finishes up causing violent actions. Violent, mm -hmm. violent. And the woman that you mentioned took violent actions both in, while she was on earth and after she passed. And these actions were taken in an effort to suppress her underlying emotions. So, so if you get down to the underlying cause, it is a lack of humility in the individual mm -hmm. that caused all of these problems. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things we probably need to say in closing this particular thing, and, and by the time we get to the end of the discussion to, uh, for people to understand, a lack of humility actually causes our own death. Mm -hmm. That's how strong the lack of humility is. Mm -hmm. if, you think of, uh, if you think of a lack of humility as a, an inability to experience all and every one of our own emotions as they occur without harming another and always being in a place of love when we experience our emotions. If we had done that, we would not grow old, we would not get sick, mm -hmm. and therefore we would never die. Mm -hmm. So the reality is a lack of humility is what causes our death, mm -hmm. not a lack of love. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting thought. And, and so if people understood that their own death is being created by their own lack of humility, maybe they would have a much greater uh, desire to look at this issue of humility than they currently do. It's sad that it has to be the threat of death that would motivate us through, exactly. don't you think? <laughs> exactly. And, and even after a person dies, their own lack of humility in the spirit world causes all of their pain. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's such an unfortunate thing that we believe on this planet that we can maintain an arrogant position you know these things that we've so far looked at and there's a lot more to look at obviously which we'll talk later about but if you look at the arrogance the facade the judgment the denial the anger and the hatred we believe we should be able to maintain all of these particular things and yet we do not understand that each one of these things play a part in the creation of our own death yeah <laughs> and so it makes no logical sense for us to stop uh, this process of becoming more humble. Mm. And, uh, you know, God is constantly desiring us to, to understand humility more than anything else because God understands that once we're in a state of humility, truth, the door of truth is open. Once the door of truth is open, the door of love is opened. And, and so without, without humility, nothing positive can happen in our life, in fact. And, and in fact, most of us know that. You know, when we're in an arrogant position with another, we know there's no resolution, there's no happiness. When we're in judgment of another, there's no resolution, there's no happiness. When we're in denial that anything bad happened, there's no resolution, there's no happiness. And we know all of that, yeah. and yet we still hold on to all of these things because we want to deny our own pain, mm. which is all of lack of humility. So, yeah. Mm. It's fantastic, babe. Thank you. As you know, I'm so passionate about this subject. Yeah, I yeah. think I said in one of the other interviews, I feel that 
this is the work this is all I have to do God already wants to know me and love me and give me truth if if only I want to know and feel myself and exercise that desire for those things yeah but I also feel there's probably one thing we should finish with and that is this thought love is something that comes from God truth is something that comes from God but humility is not something that comes from God that's my feeling yeah. humility is something that I must choose to develop for myself and uh, and so if you think about it humility is a if I make it become a part of my nature, if I actually embrace it as a, as a quality, then, then I am now giving a chance for God to do his work upon my soul. Without humility, God can do no work upon the soul. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that God can do for our soul while we lack humility. And so it becomes the most important quality that we can develop. The, the other things can come from God, but we can't, we can't get humility from God. God is constantly, through this law of attraction that God's created and other things, God's constantly trying to get us to a point where to we us. desire humility. Help us, yeah. Yeah, to help us. But, but it is a quality that we must develop ourselves we must work our way through the issues ourselves to become truly humble. Mm. And for that reason, I feel it is one of the most important things we need to understand about the divine, the, divine, the way to God, you know, the God's path, the way. Mm. Of course, there are other things that I feel just as important. For instance, forgiveness and repentance are very important aspects too. Truth is a very important aspect. But it all begins with humility. The reality is we're never going to forgive another person unless we're humble. We're never going to be repentant unless we're humble. We're never going to accept truth unless we're humble. We're never even going to accept love unless we're humble. Mm-hmm. Like, so the reality is a lot depends upon this quality being developed in our soul. And if we avoid the development of this quality in our soul, then it's highly unlikely other qualities will develop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could go on and on, yeah. but I feel that God God is already showing me his power and beauty everywhere in creation. Mm-hmm. And humility is the only thing that I must develop. I can trust that he'll be... I just have to bring that to the table. Yes. He's going to provide everything else. And I think that's important to recognise too, is that from God's perspective, humility is beautiful. Yeah. Humility is one of the most beautiful traits an individual can possess. Mm. Thanks, Thomas. All right, Spade. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to our videographers and, and helpers, sound yeah. helpers again, again today. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's.